about there, Moo? Yeah, go on. Right. Morning, everyone. Welcome to this uh, webinar. Uh, my name's Nick Morgan. I'm an area sales manager working for Zion Water. I work in the central region. Um, today, we're going to discuss the practicalities of building a pumping station that's regulatory compliant. I'm joined by my colleague, Mohamed Samatar, who's an internal proposals engineer. I uh, just passed him over to say a quick hello. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Mo. I'm the proposals engineer, as Nick has mentioned. Um, I work on quotations and designs for Nick's area. We have a buddy system, and I primarily work for his area. So every time you see Nick, you'll probably hear, you'll probably hear from me as well. So you'll hear from me later on during this presentation, but I'll pass you back over to Nick. Thank you. Right, just to say, I'll turn the, the web camera off now, uh, just so we um, save the bandwidth and uh, it allows the presentation to go smoothly. Um, I'll speak to you in a sec. Next slide, please, Mo. Uh, right, this is a continuation of the previous presentation. Uh, for any of you that missed this presentation, we can send you a link because uh, it's on YouTube. Uh, just ask at the end of the presentation and we'll send you the link. During this presentation, we're going to be looking and talking about the schedule and delivery and the resources for the mechanical electrical elements of the pumping station. And also discussing a few of the common problems that we encounter when we attend sites. During this presentation, we'll also be looking at some of the technology that's unique to Xylem I know these can improve your pumping station, plus uh, an insight into uh, package station, package pumping stations from Mo. Uh, just rest assured, we can uh, support you from the initial inception through to the installation, delivery, commissioning of the pumping station. These can even be private package pumping stations or adoptable that are ultimately adopted by the local water authority in your area. And finally, we'll. Uh, just mention a bit on the, that we can provide maintenance, rental options and monitoring for these assets. Next slide, please, Mo. If you have any questions throughout this presentation, please insert them into the question and answer section that's at the bottom of your screen and we'll try to answer as many of these as possible at the end. Next slide, please, Mo. Right, wherever possible, Zyland might try to, a safety tip into any of these webinars. And seeing it's, it's now winter, soon to be Christmas, uh, we've added this one in. Pretty much it's uh, dress appropriately for the weather conditions, ensuring you're wearing the correct footwear. If you are going out and driving, please check your vehicle where possible. The last thing you want is run out of washer liquid and such. Uh, basically, just take care through this period. Next slide, please, Mo. This is a bit of a COVID statement. This was mentioned in the previous webinar as well. Um, at Xylem, we've worked throughout the, this pandemic. Even at its height, we remained fully operational. Our engineers were on the road, attending breakdowns, maintaining pumping stations, and installing new pumping stations. Now, most staff, including ASMs, contract managers, and estimators, are all working remotely. Myself as an ASM, I only attend site now where absolutely necessary, where we can follow the company's strict guidelines for COVID and those of our customers. Ideally, we'd like to attend these meetings over team or Zoom, although understand for site meetings and pre-start meetings, these aren't really possible. So we can attend site where necessary. As I said, we will follow the company's and your guidelines on COVID. We aim to put our intentions uh, of our, the intentions of our staff and customer safety first. Next slide, please, Mo. Right, first of all, we're going to just have a look at the agenda. Um, we're going to have a slight recap from the previous webinar. What's next, which is project delivery. DSR, which is declaration of site readiness. A few of the problems, the common problems that we come across when we attend site. Mo will discuss uh, about the adaptive technology or the end pumps. Um, then we'll, I will discuss about the concerters. 
back to me for package pumping stations and commercial stations, commercial stations, and then back to me for a bit on our, of our further portfolio. Next slide, please, man. Right, recap from the previous webinar. Any of that you missed this, the previous webinar, we discussed what was or what is sewers for adoption and SSG, what information we require, the select uh, the 104 approval process, uh, including the benefits and pitfalls, and technical submission, how it's built. That was done after we've been awarded the contract. Next slide, please, man. Uh, as I said, this is the information that we require to size a pumping station. Um, this is available in a PDF format, or we do have brochures available. Uh, we can send these through if you just ask later after this presentation. We can send you an email with this information on. But basically, it's all the information that is shown there. That is what we require. Next slide, please, Mel. Um, this is just to say what we do with that information once you've actually filled it in and sent it back to us. Uh, we will complete the hydraulic calculations, produce the, the quotation. Once we've been awarded the contract, we will produce a technical submission. If necessary, if the rising main is over 500 metres in length, we will produce the surge analysis. This, as I said, this is only required if the rising main is over 500 metres in length. This is done in-house and is required by the adopting water authority uh, during the S104 approval. And finally, we'll deliver the project to coincide with your delivery program or your timescales. Next slide, please, Mo. All right, project delivery. Um, this usually follows our appointment and we'll start with the purchase, we'll start the purchasing process. And ultimately, the supply, delivery, installation and commission of the pumping station. The project delivery usually follows the S104 approval process, as I said. However, if timescales don't fit, we can be instructed to proceed at risk. However, we would need this in writing. This passes any commercial risk onto the principal designer and principal contractor. Uh, we can amend uh, post-approval modifications these can take place at any time during the approval process up until the time where we issue purchase orders. This may include any final comments from the adopting water authority. Uh, when you've started on site and prior to our attendance, we will issue RAMs. We can attend pre-start meetings where necessary. These will be attended uh, by myself and ASM and a contact delivery manager if possible. Uh, once you've got all this information and you, the drawings have been issued for construction, it's up to your ground worker to construct the, the pumping station as per the approved drawings. Xylem, usual installation and adoptable uh, of pumping stations usually takes uh, three visits. During each of these visits, we'll issue a declaration of site readiness for each stage that must be signed and returned so we can arrange labour and our engineers' attendance. Don't worry, this is not uh, a real problem to sign. It's just a tick sheet, um, ticking that you've got things in place ready for us to attend. Next slide, please, Mo. All right, this is the first fix. Uh, this is our first physical visit to site to begin the installation process. This is usually completed over two to three days. However, this will depend on the pipework size and the complexity of the project. During this visit, we will install the auto coupling, vertical legs, guide rails, interconnecting pipework that goes between the wet well and the valve chamber, the valve chamber pipework, including gate valves and non-return valves, and any overpumping pipework if deemed necessary. That will always depend on which water authority has taken over the pumping station. We'll also endeavour to complete all earth bonding, especially in the wet well, so, we, so on further visits, we don't have to get into the wet well, so it's confined space entry, health and safety concerns. During this first fix, our engineers may need some assistance with the installation of heavy equipment. Um, by now, uh, civils, um, we would have issued 
um, the David socket, baffle plate, penstock, sludge plugs, all for your civils team to install. These are supply only items. As I said, they would have been delivered to site for your civils contractor to install. What is to be installed will depend on what water authority is ultimately taking over the pumping station. Next slide, please, ma'am. Uh, the second fix. This is usually completed over two days. During the second fix, the kiosk, including control panel, are located on a precast concrete plinth and fixed down. Pumps, float switches, ultrasonic brackets and cabling are pulled through the ducts into the kiosk and connected into the control panel. During the installation of the pumps, our engineers, as I said, may need some attendance, and this is because of weight, health and safety. During this visit, we'll also complete any outstanding works that weren't completed during the first fix. As I said, this may include bonding of the access covers that may have now been delivered to site direct from our suppliers. Uh, once the pumps have been installed, it's the ground worker's responsibility to install the benching. This benching has to be installed as per our drawings that have all been approved by the water authority. If they aren't, as per our drawings, the ultim ultimately the, the water authority could refuse to adopt the station. Following this visit, it's the customer's responsibility to have the power supply installed into the meter compartment, including meters and isolation points. Next slide, please, ma'am. And finally, we get to the commissioning. The commissioning of the pumping station usually takes place over one day. The panel should now be live and we can wet test the pumping station. This will involve energizing the pumps, charging the rising main, and ultimately ensuring the pumps pump the liquid up the rising main and through to the discharge chamber. Following this, we will issue a commissioning certificate, including the NIC EIC certification that will be required by the adopting water authority. The overall process from first fix to commission usually takes 10 to 12 weeks. However, during this pandemic, it's increased typically to 12 to 14 weeks. Next slide, please, Mo. Now I'd just like to take a little bit of time to discuss a few of the common problems that we come across when we attend site. Um, first fix, um, we've attended many sites in the past and there's been debris in the water or there's been debris in the well or water within the well. This needs to be emptied so our engineers can gain access. We've got to fix the auto coupling down to the concrete, the base at the bottom of the well. And obviously to do this, they're going to be using electrical apparatus. So this needs to be clean and dry. Uh, the, we've attended also a few sites where the cover slabs have not been in place of the inlet manhole and wet well. These need to be in place because we bolt bracketry, including float brackets and guide rail brackets to them. Uh, area between the wet well and valve chamber not shored up. The area between the valve chamber and the wet well, we have a lot of pipe work um, going through. And these include a, a number of VJs. This area needs to be shored up because our engineers are in a confined space installing this equipment. The last thing we want is to, to have a, a cave in or any of this material to fall on us, on, onto our engineers. We also need the ground level to be raised up to the wet well. If it isn't, our engineers can't gain access, they can't do the installation. If the wet well is core drilled for the interconnecting pipe work, this must be in line and not on the perpendicular to the circumference. What that means is if you're on the perpendicular, as you've got the pipe work going through, you've got less of a clearance between our pipe work and the circumference. In the past, it used to be uh, um, a letterbox arrangement. However, I've noticed recently that um, water authorities are asking for this to be core drilled again. Um, right, the photos that are shown there, the one on the second left, that shows benchings installed as per our design. Typical, very good installation. Uh, we have had instances where we've turned up in the past and there's been very little benching in. It needs to be installed as per our designs. 
which the way the benching starts at 100 millimeters from the volute and terminates at the edge of the of the, the internal of the concrete ring. Uh, the third photo shows our pipework that's been installed into the chamber. Um, our engineers, when installing this pipework, will uh, level it up on, on bricks or any materials that are lying around. These need to ultimately be removed and the proper concrete supports cast as per sewage reduction. And finally, the photo on the right shows uh, rather excessive supports. Uh, this is a, a recent contract uh, where the, the groundwork has installed this concrete support. Uh, as you can see there, if any of those gate valves fail, to remove the bolt work holding the, 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 the valve in place, they can need to remove part of the concrete support or remove it completely. I discussed this with the local adopting water authority and they've said that will need to be removed prior to adoption. Again, this could um, slow the adoption process down. Now I'm just getting past to Mo to uh, discuss a little on pumps. Over to you, Mo. Thanks, Nick. Um, so we've given you an insight into the adoptable side of things and think it may be actually uh, informative for yourselves to understand a little bit more about how a pump works. So while the diagram to the right isn't an indication of a submersible pump, it still helps as a visual aid with this explanation. The only difference for a submersible pump being that the pump would actually be in the container. Um, point A represents the water level you are trying to move, and point B is where you are trying to move the liquid to, with Q representing the flow rate, or how quick the water moves from uh, the pump to point B. There are two main components of a pump, and these are the impeller and volume, which I will talk about in greater detail on the next slide, but you can see an example of an impeller on the bottom left-hand side of this slide. So this enters through the center or the axis through the eye of the impeller and leaves along the blade angle and that's rotated. The impeller is rotated mechan mechanically via a drive shaft and it's this rotational energy that forces the liquid out along its circumference. So rotating the impeller at high speeds increases the pressure of the liquid force it, of the liquid uh, which forces the liquid to move from point A to point B and the rotational force is referred to as centrifugal, hence centrifugal pumps. So the way that I tend to think of this is when you are drinking a, uh, a drink through a straw, uh, what you are doing is you're lowering the pressure in your mouth, forcing the liquid in the cup or whatever you're drinking from through the straw and into your mouth. So it's the same concept here. So in order to size a pump, uh, there are two critical items required for pump selection, and these are the duty and static heads. The static head in pump theory is independent of the pipe profile and is a measure uh, used to, that that's defined to define the height of the liquid that the pump has to move. So this would be the difference between point, e, point A and the invert of the pipe entering point B, which is the highest that the liquid has to move. The duty head or head loss is a measure that's calculated and it's used to tell us what the frictional losses within the pipe would be that the pumps would have to overcome to achieve. So the frictional losses are essentially a summation of the expected losses in pressure or velocity because of the contact between the fluid and the walls of the pipes. The aforementioned points so the duty and the static head are then used to calculate a duty point required for a pump and impeller and a suitable pump and impeller combination is then uh, selected for each individual application. So as an aside, uh, there are two types of pumps, uh, positive displacement pumps, which offer a constant volume, regardless of pressure and what we tend to deal with more, uh, which are rotor dynamic pumps, uh, which offer various flows depending on the system pressure. On the top right hand side, uh, you can see a section view of the pump volume and impeller. In this instance, it's shown as uh, mounted vertically with the flows coming in from the bottom at point one and leaving at point four. Point one shows the inlet to the pump and impeller, and the impeller is the bit shown in red, and this is, this is what rotates. The picture on the bottom right uh, shows a similar section, but looking from the bottom of the pump. You can see that the direction the impeller rotates and the smooth transition of the casing provided and the casing in blue is known as the volume. 
So the volute has two parts, but they both have the same function of providing a smooth transition of flows from the impeller to the outlet. And you can see from the image all the way from point two, the inlet volute to point three, the outlet volute or diffuser, that there is a gradual increase in size. This increase in size reduces the pressure as this is directly proportional to the area, but increases the uh, velocity as it's inversely proportional. The trajectory on the graph shows just that with the pressure rising sharply uh, between points one and two, and then slowly decreasing in a smooth and controlled manner along points two, three, and four, which represent the inlet and outlet volutes. Within our industry, uh, there are three common types of impellers that are used. Uh, all of them operate using the same principle of forcing a fluid to enter the impeller through its eye, or also referred to as the throughlet, and exits along the circumference of the impeller. So we've got channel impellers, which tend to be single vein, and they can come in an open or closed variation. The open and closed refers to the discs around the impeller itself. An impeller is referred an open impeller, sorry, is referred to one not being backed by a disc. So if it's got one disc, it's referred to as semi-open. And if it's got two surrounding the impeller, it's referred to as closed. So channel impellers, uh, they tend to be closed and have a relatively low efficiency. However, with multiple impeller veins, higher efficiency can be achieved. Vortex impellers, uh, which tend to be the most common within our, our industry, have their advantages in comparison to the channel impeller as the channel impeller tends to be closed. Vortex impeller, impellers, however, um, are known to have a lower efficiency. So common problems with the above impellers are that blockages and in turn service visits are more common. And it's more so because of the stringier objects that get caught in the impellers. And when I say stringy objects, I'm, I, I mean wet wipes and raggy material. So the, the leading edge of the impeller veins tend to catch onto them and they tend to get caught up in the impellers themselves. So to attempt to combat this, there have been many designs that have just maximized the through let of the pumps, but this has not really had the desired effect. So while we can offer both um, channel and vortex impellers, we tend to recommend the N adaptive, especially for foul water, which is a semi-open impeller with backswept leading edges and the guide pin. The backswept leading edges work together with the guide pin to sweep solids from the center to the perimeter of the inlet. So when solids arrive at the perimeter, they get transported inside a relief groove, uh, sliding along the edge of the impeller vein through the volume and out of the pump. So the, the graphs on the right uh, show a normally distributed curve, identifying the probability of finding different types of solids in wastewater. So the one on the bottom uh, shows the types of solids that can pass through a traditional impeller with a larger throughlet. So you can see that there are difficulties, as mentioned before, uh, with stringier objects. So the N adaptive manages to combat this by allowing for a guide pin that latches onto the stringier objects and guides these towards the throughlet, as mentioned. So as such, you can see the comparison graph on the top right hand side, where it can clearly be seen that the N adaptive has a larger pass through volume when looking at stringy objects. The adaptive element is, is the bit where the impeller can move actually upwards, which enables some more tough, tougher rags and debris to pass through. So our next slide uh, contains a video uh, showing pretty much the elements that I've talked about of the N, N uh, adaptive.
and I'll pass you on to Nick to talk about the Concerta. Right, as everyone in this industry knows, um, RAG is an issue uh, and often cause, cause, causes failures of pumping stations. Um, with this in mind, um, Flight book out the, the Concerta range of pumps. Uh, this is more of a pumping system than just a pump. Um, it includes the end technology uh, for the impeller, as Mo's discussed. Uh, what it does have, however, is the, the brains of the pump are at the head of the pump. Um, this, this can do various different things. Um, what it can do, if it senses um, the, the, the impeller is getting rag built around it um, and slowing down, pulling more amps, it can rotate backwards to take that blockage out. Uh, it will do this 20 times to remove the blockage, ultimately passing the blockage, and then you're, you're good to go as you were before. It's a normal pump. Um, it also has built-in cleaning cycles, which means it'll let the, the, the level in the wet well go to a higher level, which increases the head then when the pump starts up, it will stump, start at a higher velocity, push the water through the system, therefore cleaning the, the rising main, the pipework in the valve chamber and the wet well. Um, we have had a few problem sites we've installed these on um, where we've had numerous call outs. Um, these have all been rectified and uh, it, it's been a, a, a really good uh, problem solver. Um, with the flight concerta, we can offer a, a, a guarantee of clog free operation. As you can imagine, there's very few people that can say they offer a guarantee for clog free operation and flight are willing to stand with what they say. Uh, we can supply more information on these pumps if you require at the end of this presentation. You can either send us an email or offer it into the chat and we can send you a link and we can send you information about these pumps. Thank you. Just pass back to Mo. Um, so we can also uh, assist with private stations, which are to be maintained privately by definition. Um, we have a package pump station range that we offer and design. Uh, this just means, um, and by package, we mean um, that the product is inclusive of pipes and fittings during manufacture, uh, with the pumps being installed at a later date alongside the commissioning of the station, if required. Uh, the idea being that it makes things simpler on site and more cost effective. So these can be of varying materials, but most commonly GRP and polyethylene, as well as varying ranges. So we've got the micro and compit stations, which are small and can be configured for single pump operations and some variations. These tend to serve smaller applications and they are off the shelf items with pre-configured inlet and outlet levels. The SPS unit, uh, which is our cheapest variation of a GRP tank, uh, it offers customizable outlets and orientations. These are bespoke manufactured in terms of diameters and depths. The TOPS units are also GRP with the same customizable features as our SPS tanks. The differing factor here is that it comes with a preformed benching unit to guide solids towards the inlet of the pumps. So this can be seen from the picture on the top right hand side. Uh, as the bottom of the tank caves in slightly to follow the shape of the benching. The picture on the bottom right hand side shows just that profile, which can be used for uh, what we refer to as a commercial station, but I'll, I'll cover that in a couple of slides. Traditionally, uh, all of all units I've just mentioned will have the pipe work and valve arrangement within the chamber itself, but the top unit can have a separate valve chamber as well if required. Um, this unit is actually adoptable by certain water authorities for type one and two stations, with Welsh Water even incorporating our top unit drawings into their standard uh, drawings for types one, two, and three. So we also offer uh, GRP horizontal units for sites that require a larger storage amount. The horizontal tank will come with a sump for the pumps to fit in. So no matter what type of package you choose, there will be some installation instructions bespoke to the type of package that is selected. We also make allowances for a panel, kiosk, with or without meter space uh, and telemetry if required. So as mentioned before, uh, we've got 
pump stations in a variety of uh, shapes and sizes, and I'll talk you through them. Uh, so on the, on the top left hand side, uh, we've got the Micro 3, 5 and 7. So it's, and they're designed specifically for indoor installation, with there being a 5G and 7G variant uh, designed specifically for below ground installation. Uh, they tend to be useful for very small volumes uh, and allows for single pump operation with some volumes ranging from 80 to 250 litres. The picture next to that uh, shows our micro 6 plus 6 range and has the design functionality of the micro range but allows for a, a dual pump system and offers a slightly larger capacity of around 550 litres. This can also be installed above or below ground. The picture next to that is our Micro 10, so that's the third from left on the on the top row. And this is available in two heights, uh, 1.3 and 2 metres, with capacities of 1,200 and 1,900 litres respectively. So this still has the pre-configured inlet and outlet orientations and levels. And the, pic and the last picture on the top right is our compute unit, which again, similar to the Micro 10, has a pre-configured inlet and outlet orientation. The image on the bottom left hand side uh, shows our SPS unit uh, and as mentioned before the it's the first of our uh, fully customizable range in regards to design so we can change the diameters and depths depending on site levels inlet and outlet orientation and optimal pump performance the picture to the right of that so in the middle on the bottom row um, shows the horizontal tank and this is one we specify if the storage volume exceeds the capabilities of an of an SPS unit or a TOPS unit. As a general rule of thumb, uh, I tend to say anything requiring around 15 meters cubed or greater uh, of storage would be looking at sizing a horizontal unit. Of course, this depends on the position of the inlet invert level and top water level. We can see from the picture um, that there is a sump below the tank and this is where the pumps operate from and the operating levels are all within the sump itself. So it's the entire volume of the horizontal tank that's generally utilized for storage. So above the sump, you can see a turret with an opening large enough for the pumps to be taken out. There's also an option uh, for, for man access and we can offer a man access turret. And this is made available depending on the, the length of, of the tanks. And these are circular in profile. And on this picture, we've got three there. On the bottom right hand side, uh, it's the TOPS unit, uh, and as mentioned before, the profile is conical to suit the benching uh, profile, which ensures that solids are guided towards the pumps. Again, this can be sized with or without a valve chamber. We can also develop a design solution for what we refer to as a commercial station, where our pumps will be installed in precast concrete rings. So this is sized depending on site levels. Uh, storage and pump requirements, just like the package pump stations, with the only difference here being that all the ME elements that are completed by ourselves are done on site. So as these are more involved, uh, upon receipt of order, we produce site specific engineering drawings of what we propose with the end customer having to approve those drawings. Uh, benching is still important for these, even though these are to be privately maintained. Um, however, it's worth noting that we can offer preformed benching units, which are shown a couple of slides before and this is essentially the base of the TOPS unit and they can be incorporated into these stations. Uh, this tends to be the best option for sites with a high water table. While a package or a commercial station won't be adoptable we still have to ensure to abide by building regulations which dictates the amount of emergency storage that's required. We also have to ensure to size the station in line with the inflow of the station. I wouldn't expect the same inflow from, um, for example, a single home as a couple of public toilets on a petrol station. So as such, our peak inflow calculations are calculated on a case by case basis using various methods that are available to us. For surface water stations, depending on the inlet invert level, uh, sizing tends to be minimal as storage based on the peak inflow tends to be attenuated elsewhere with a flow control chamber prior to the pump station. For foul water, however, it's slightly different and we are required to store 150 litres per person per day for dwellings uh, as per the building regulations. In contrast to the requirement of 160 litres per dwelling per day for most water authorities, you can see how quick this emergency storage figure can add up. The reason for this is adoptable pump 
adoptable pump stations are sure to be maintained via telemetry and issues are flagged straight away resulting in a quicker action to respond. So for a package or a commercial station, it isn't, it isn't a requirement to have these maintained via telemetry and as such it can take longer for someone to realise that there actually is a problem. So where do we provide the storage? Um, the first option is the pump station itself, if the site levels allow. Secondly, we can review the upstream network if we are uh, provided with manhole schedules and layouts um, to see how much of the storage we can spread between the pump station and uh, the wet well resulting in a smaller station. Please note that we would consider storage up to the lowest public lateral um, as these cannot be flooded. So if the pump station is having to cater for a lot of info, uh, we size for a horizontal tank, but we can size for an additional storage chamber as well, but this would be supplied by others. While it's necessary for us to be provided with all the information to size for a package of commercial station, we understand that certain elements may be more difficult to have at first. So as such, what I've done is I've highlighted uh, the key levels that we need alongside information regarding the expected inflow. Which is which are the uh, inlet invert level and the rising main discharge points. So you've got point B and F, and they're used to calculate the static head. If you know what the expected lift is, uh, this can be used alongside assuming a, a, a datum point for a cover level. We also need to know the rising main length, which is E, and that will help us to calculate the um, duty or, or the head losses uh, in the station and rising main. Please note, however, that we reserve the right to amend such quotes if, if you, the customer, subsequently provide the information which we have previously had to make assumptions and they're different from the assumptions that we've made. Please also note that this is the bare minimum that we require to provide a quotation, but of course, the more information we are presented with, the better and more uh, tailored our design can be for your site. So, as mentioned before, um, Xylem will provide installation instructions for our stations upon receipt of order for our GRP units. So while the installation instructions should entail everything, we have a list of do's and don'ts uh, for our package pump stations, and most notably, we want to dig the hole uh, to be a suitable depth and provide a concrete base for the tank. Remember that handling and offloading is done by others. Remember to backfill and provide a brick neck. Uh, remember to provide a plinth for a kiosk, if there is a kiosk. Um, in terms of the don'ts, remember that the access cover is not to be placed directly onto the tank and it hasn't been designed to, to bear such loads. And don't, don't forget any civil calculations and, and just remember that we only advise on the M&E portion and any advice or civil uh, calculations should be, should be sought if it's not within your remit. Um, and I'll pass you on to Nick to take you through the rest of the presentation. Cheers, man. Um, right, regardless of the simplicity or the complexity of your project, just like rest assured that Xylem are here to help you. Um, it's, it's best to get us involved early doors. Um, as I said, we can attend meetings. We are here to help. Uh, not only can we design and install your pumping stations, we also have the ability to maintain, monitor, and offer rental solutions where necessary. With this in mind, we have just a few slides showing the, the further services and applications that we can offer. Next slide, please, Mo. Right, this uh, is a, just a bit of a, a slide on our smart telemetry. Uh, this shows extracts from our bureau system, which is our smart telemetry feeds back to. Um, we can offer telemetry on every project or a service contract. Uh, this will give you peace of mind that your system has been monitors, monitored 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days, days a year. Therefore, reducing the risk if a failure should occur is it can cause problems of flooding on site. If necessary, we can send you a link to your smartphone application, and this could be uh, viewed or monitored by yourself on your phone as well. Next slide, please, Mike. Uh, we have a number of rental hubs throughout the UK uh, that can assist you. 
Uh, this may include, include rental of pumps uh, because your site has got a number of social housing on that you now need to have online before your pumping station is going to be completed. Or you've got a show home that you want to open and that's connected to the system. All these need to have uh, a way of getting rid of their sewage. As I said, we have these rental pubs that can uh, offer solutions and rental equipment. We can also off offer dewatering and over pumping equipment. This doesn't necessarily need to be a xylem installation. We can offer our pumping solutions uh, retrofitable to equipment of our competitors and install where needed. Next slide, please, Mike. This slide just shows a few of our rental applications. These may include temporary control panels, pumps, or even chemical dosing systems. As we all know, when you have a pumping station and it's bought online, you don't have all the properties connected all at once. So you can have uh, instances where your sewage is going septic, so, as I said, we can offer a chemical dosage system on a rental basis for that as well. Next slide, please, Michael. And finally, we can offer you uh, the service and maintenance contract for many water and wastewater assets. Um, we do have many uh, brochures and literature on this. If you require any information on these following this uh, presentation, please let us know and we can send you further information. Next slide, please, Mo. And finally, thank you for your attendance. And if you have any questions, uh, please put them forward and we'll see what we can answer. If we aren't able to answer all of them, we will endeavour to uh, answer them following this presentation. Yep. Thanks, Nick. So I've I've gone through some of the uh, some of the questions while you were while you were talking, and look, I'll answer a couple of them and I'll I'll read them out. And I'll read a couple out for you as well, if that's all right okay. with you. Yeah. Um, so the first one here I've got, um, and again, I've got to make sure it's all anonymous. Um, the first one I've got here is, my ground worker has constructed the wet well and valve chamber to the wrong dimensions. Can Zyla make the pumps and pipe work fit the as-built chamber? So um, in almost all circumstances, we're able to rework a design and identify a workable solution to what has already been built uh, on site. In most cases, there'll be changes to equipment. You know, uh, it'll be the, the pumps, the, the impeller to the pump, maybe the motor uh, and or control panel. So, but for a package station, the overall control is with the customer and, and it's fairly straightforward. But for an SFA station, it becomes a little more problematic because you need to, have approval from the water authority and you need to go through the reapproval process uh, to ensure that they will still agree to adopt the revised design. So in, in extreme circumstances it would be possible for the water authority to actually refuse to adopt and even when they will accept a revised design it normally incurs extra adoption authority fees, uh, longer installation times, delays to a, a site program uh, returned and replacement uh, equipment, so all of which uh, increased time and cost. Another another question I've, I can see here um, is with regard to the packaged pump stations, what pipe diameters are you able to supply in? I'll answer that one as well. Um, so we've got the MIDI, Micro and Compit, and these stations are supplied in 50 and 65 millimeter options. We've got the SPS tops and horizontal stations and, and they can be supplied in 50 mil through to 150 mil with uh, larger diameter pipes being made available as special orders. So uh, where the package station and the pump selection is able to accommodate. And um, that's, that's two questions I've got there. Um, I've got another one for you, Nick. Um, so I've got what vehicular access is required for the pumping station install? Right. Our engineers uh, drive sprinter vans or transit vans, um, and they require access to the, the wet well and or the chamber area. Now, uh, these are not 4 by 4 vehicles, so ideally we will need some kind of MOT or hard standing for, for, the, for them to drive down. 
Um, in the compound, they'll also need somewhere to park and that'll need to be uh, compacted material as well. Um, the engineers carry a lot of equipment. Um, during this insulation period, they will need to get into the wet well. So they'll have tripods, uh, harnesses, uh, drills, um, a varying range of equipment that they have to carry. So these vans are quite heavy. Um, so they'll need some kind of vehicular access that is compact material down to that station. Okay, so I've got another question as well for you. Um, it's when should the declaration of site readiness be sent back? Okay, right. As I mentioned during the presentation, um, declaration of site readiness, those are issued uh, for each phase of our installation, first fix, second fix, third uh, first fix, second fix, and finally commissioning. Um, these declarations of site net readiness will identify items that are needed to be completed and installed prior to our ascendance. Um, as I said, they're a tick sheet and they just need to be returned back to us during each stage. So when we've done the first fix, you'll, we'll um, send you a declaration of site readiness ready for your second fix. If you just tick off what's been completed, anything that's outstanding will need to be completed as per this declaration, and then we can book the labour in to reattend. Uh, so it's just really after each stage of attendance or prior to our attendance for the first fix. That's it, man. Okay, um, I've got one more. Um, it's are you able to help us size the incoming power supply? Um, I'll, I'll answer that. Um, so we're able to. We won't be able to size the incoming power supply, but we are able to uh, advise of the KVA ratings, uh, which will be used to size the incoming power supply itself. Um, and that's that's another question there. Um, I think that's all the questions that we've got, and we've answered everything. So unless there's any more questions, um, I think we can we can call this webinar. Okay. Thanks for everyone attending. And uh, if you've had any questions or you have further questions following this webinar, uh, please send them through to us. I'm sure we'll be in contact with you. Thank you very much. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.